you, Brother Harris, for that wonderful question. Number places, number of places in Scripture that question is asked. And uh, when we look at how great God is, I think about uh, Isaiah. He saw God high and lifted up, and his response was, "Woe is woe is me." And uh, that must be the uh, the response. Who am I that God would? Uh, being so good to send his son, Jesus Christ, to, to die for me. What a, what a great song. Thank you, uh, Brother Harris, for that. Numbers chapter 24 in your Bibles. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a warning ahead of time that this is more like a Wednesday night message than it is a Sunday morning message, kind of, kind of a Bible study in a sense. And uh, we will uh, preach about something we see interwoven into pretty much every book in the Bible. And... Um, and uh, see an aspect in the, in the book of Numbers, uh, an aspect of a, a, a story in the book of Numbers that we don't often focus on when we focus on this story. So Numbers chapter 24, verse number 10, if you're able and willing to join me in standing, I'd ask you to do that in, honoring, in honor of the, the word of God. Verse number 10 of Numbers 24, and Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. And he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore, now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. What an what a, a ironic statement that the Lord's keeping him back from honor. Well, he's keeping him back from Balak's honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, verse 12, Spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me the, uh, the, his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord, to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord hath said, that will I speak. Didn't I tell your servants that I was going to say that? Verse 14. And now and now, behold, I go unto my people. Uh, uh, I go unto my people. So basically, before I go to my people, let me, let me tell you something. I, now, behold, I go to my people. Come, therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. Verse 15, and he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And, we looked, and when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Kenites, and took up this parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from the coast of Chittim, and shall afflict Asher, and shall afflict Eber, and he shall also perish forever. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. This morning I'd like to preach on the prophecy, or the parable, the prophecy of Balaam. And um, we'll get into this this morning. Father in heaven, I, I pray you'd help me uh, lift you up this morning. That's my desire, to lift you up, to... Uh, not that you need lifting up. You, you certainly don't need me uh, to lift you up, Lord. But uh, I, I desire to magnify you, to glorify you, to, to see you as the most high and to uh, be able to uh, allow others to see you as who you truly are. Lord, I, I don't think we'll have any problem 
uh, asking the question, who am I? Uh, humbling ourselves, Lord, if we'll see you for who you are and that you're high and uh, the Almighty, high and lifted up. And Lord, I pray, God, that you bless as we preach this morning. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, I pray that you be with those that uh, are ill. I think about the Farnham family. I think about some that even left uh, this morning that came, that d- desired to be in church, but were not feeling well. And we pray you bless them. And uh, we pray that you would uh, you'd fill us with your spirit, fill each hearer with your spirit. And we ask it all in Jesus Christ's name for his sake. We pray it. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Real quick, before I get to the message, I failed to mention during prayer time, uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Palmer was not feeling well at all. Brother Dan's back was really bothering him. They were here for Sunday school. Please be in prayer for them uh, uh, um, as they're struggling with their health. Um, Numbers chapter 24, we read there in, in, uh, the, uh, about Balak. Let me kind of give you some background. The children of Israel had been saved from the clutches and the chains of Egypt. They were journeying through the wilderness to the promised land. A lack of faith in God had caused them a delay in their realization of the blessings of the promised land for 40 long years. While they wandered through the wilderness, they encountered a number of enemies that did not want them wandering through their land. One of these enemies was the people of Moab, cousins, if you will, of the Israelites as they were descendants of the incestuous relationship of Lot and his older daughter. The king of Moab was a man by the name of Balak, or Balak. Uh, Balak saw what the Israelites did to the Amorites and did not want to be the next loser in a string of Hebrew victories. So Balak went and hired a prophet, Balaam. He hired him to curse the nations of Israel. The hiring didn't go, or didn't come out, uh, didn't come with, without difficulty, it didn't go as planned. Balaam told Balak that he would only prophesy what the Lord told him to prophesy. There is much we could say about the story of Balaam. His donkey normally gets most of the spotlight in the story. How many remember the story of Balak and his, or Balaam and his donkey? But in the end, Balaam was unable not allowed by God, the God of heaven and the Hebrews, to curse the nation of Israel. Three different times, Balaam set out to curse Israel. Balak hired him, and he would go to a high place or to a, a mountain, and he would say, I want you to look down on Israel and curse them. And Balaam would set out to curse Israel, and instead of curses coming out, blessings would come out. And, and, and Balak, each time up the ante, if you will, He said, I'll pay you more, or I'll give you more. And each time they would go to a high mountain or a high place, and Balaam would look out over Israel uh, and different places, different parts of Israel, the children of Israel. And as he endeavored to to give a, a curse out of his mouth, came a blessing instead of a curse. Before... Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. By the way, it's not mentioned in the book of Numbers, but if you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, I think it's verse 14. Um, I don't have it in my notes, but in the book of Revelation, regardless, uh, it, it mentioned, in fact, Balaam is mentioned throughout the Bible in a number of places. Many people go back and reference Balaam and, and his... Uh, um, his a willingness to go against the people of God, and I believe Balaam was one of God's children. In fact, he says, this my people, uh, here in the passage that we read. And so uh, Balaam clearly knew the Lord, and when, we, when, when he was introduced to us, he, he said, I'll just, I'll only prophesy what the Lord tells me to do. And whether he was Israelite, whether he was Hebrew or not, is regardless, he definitely knew the Lord. And... and uh, um, and he, when the servants of Balak came, he said, I'm only going to say what the Lord tells me to say. I can't say anything else. And so uh, in the end, and we go to the book of Revelation, uh, Balaam teaches Balak to set a stumbling block. And it mentions a number of things, uh, uh, including uh, basically all going against the, the law of God. And we see that they basically seduced. And you can't, if they can't curse Israel, then seduce them. And that's what Balaam taught Balak. And so before Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, Balaam showed Balak what would happen to his people 
in the latter days. And that's where we have this, we see in verse number 14, we read verses 10 through 13 to kind of help you understand this is the end of that story. Balaam has attempted to curse Israel three times, all three times he's blessed Israel. And now in verse 14, Balaam says, now come here, before I go back to my people, let me show you what's going to happen to your people in the latter days. In verse number 15, it says he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High. So Balaam is establishing the idea. He said, I, I've heard God. I know him. I have the knowledge of him. I'm not talking about a false God. I'm not talking about an idol. I'm talking about the almighty God. I know him. I've heard him. I have, I've heard him. I have knowledge of him. He hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, I've seen the vision of the Almighty, he says, and saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, he said, I shall see him. I shall see him. A future, a prophecy. I'm going to see him, but I'm not going to see him now. The idea is this is something that's going to happen, as he mentioned in verse number 14, in the latter days. I see him. I know him. But he's not here yet. I don't see him here in front of me. I know him. I know what he looks like. I've seen him, but he's not. I see him. I shall see him, but not now. Notice the next phrase. I shall behold him, but not nigh. It's not tomorrow. It's not the next day. It's not near. Nigh is near. He doesn't give a, a day or a time. He doesn't, give, he doesn't prophesy a specific place in history, but he said, I shall see him, I shall behold him, I don't see him now, and it's not near, it's not nigh, but we will see him. What did he see? What was he prophesying? Of whom was he prophesying? He said, there shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. As we go through this passage, we see the children of Seth, I'm sorry, Sheth, the, the children of Moab, the Edomites, uh, um, the Kenites, the, uh, um, the um, I didn't uh, circle this, I have my notes, uh, the Eber, uh, of those from Asher and Eber of the children of Israel. Uh, um, it seems like there's one other that I'm missing in here. The Amalekites, I believe, are in here. Anyway, there's uh, six different peoples that are going to be destroyed. That he says, You're gonna, we're going to destroy them. Uh, they will be destroyed in the latter days. He mentioned, number one, look at verse number 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Jacob. He said, first of all, a king is coming. Now, the king that he's talking about, or he's, uh, to, to whom he's referring, is not David. Now, David will come. This is before David. This is the book of Numbers. This is before uh, 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 Joshua is the king, and, or the, the leader of Israel, and leads them into the promised land. Uh, this is before the time of Judges. Uh, this is before the time of Eli, and the time of Samuel, and the time of Saul, and the time of David. It's before all of this. And he's prophesying that a king will come. A king is coming. Secondly, he prophesied this. Look at verse number 18. Uh, as we finish reading verse 17, a star out of Jacob, a scepter. The scepter is a, a symbol of the authority of a king. He said a king is coming. Star out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And then we see this, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth, and Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Secondly, we see a conqueror is, come, is rising. A king is coming, and a conqueror is rising. There will be someone who comes and conquers every kingdom. A king is coming, a conqueror is rising, 
And then look at verse number 19. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. That, that word dominion refers to the authority of a king and a kingdom. And he shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Uh, the prophecy is this. A king is coming, a conqueror is rising, and a kingdom is remaining. He said in the latter days, there will be a king that comes, a conqueror that rises, and a kingdom that remains. This kingdom will have dominion over all of these people, all of these peoples. The word of God is teeming with prophesy, uh, prophecies of the king, the conqueror, and the kingdom. Book of Genesis, way back to Adam and Eve, when he says he shall bruise his heel, or uh, he shall bruise his heel, uh, and it shall bruise his head, he shall bruise his heel. It's prophesying of a king that's going to come and destroy a conqueror all in one verse. If way back in Genesis 3, we see the idea of a king and a, a conqueror, a kingdom coming. We can read of this kingdom in almost every book of the Bible. It's not something that, honestly, I don't know that I've preached on the kingdom of God before. Uh, and we're talking about his literal kingdom. Not talking about, although he rules right now, where is his throne now? In heaven. I'm talking about a literal throne, a literal king, a literal conqueror on this planet, on this world. He's coming to be that. And that prophecy is, is woven into, it could be every book. I, I don't know that I've seen it in every book, but almost every book in the entire Bible has this idea of a coming, conquering king to set up a worldwide kingdom. That's conquering every people. Abraham spoke of it. In fact, the promises of Abraham, the, the king coming, uh, Jesus Christ, the, the, when Jesus Christ came as the sacrifice, uh, he, he fulfilled many of the prophecies of, to Abraham, but there are still some prophecies to Abraham that have yet to be fulfilled, that will be fulfilled in this coming of a conqueror and a king. And a kingdom. I think about prophecies to Moses. Prophecies to David. Moses wrote about uh, uh, this prophecy in the book of Numbers. I realize it's Balaam that's giving this prophecy. But Moses is the one that the Spirit of God inspired to write it down. And Moses writes about this kingdom. David writes about the coming kingdom. David writes about the eternal kingdom. Isaiah the, the, the prophets, major and minor, are, are brimming with prophecies of the coming kingdom. These prophecies are what Israel focused on and the, the religious, the Pharisees focused on. Even we, when we took, talked in the book of Acts that the disciples focused on when Jesus came. Remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on the, the colt and they put the palm branches down at his feet, and they said, Son of David, the Messiah, the, the chosen one, the anointed one, the king. They expected him to come as a conquering king, the conqueror, the king, to set up the kingdom. John the Baptist, what did he preach? The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus preached the kingdom of God. He gave parables of the kingdom of God. Or the kingdom of heaven. Peter spoke of the kingdom of God. Paul preached of the kingdom of God. John, the beloved, preached on the kingdom of God. All of these spoke about the coming conqueror, king, and kingdom. Where else can we read about this kingdom, this conqueror, this king, this kingdom? Take your Bibles, if you would, and go with me over the book of Revelation. We've read quite a few verses in the book of Numbers. And I would like to, this, evening, this morning, read several verses, a number of verses, out of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is not a book I've, from which I've preached a lot as pastor. But as I read this passage in the book of Numbers... 
course, Balaam went to, to curse Israel, and each time, three different times, he blessed Israel. But this last time was different from the other three times. This last time, he said, come, Balak, let me show you what's going to happen in the latter, the last days. Now, prophecy, the, the, the word of God had not been completed at that point. We have the completed, inspired word of God. You have that in your lap. The book of Revelation gives us another view of who the king is and how he will come. Look in Revelation chapter 19. We could read a, a lot here, but let's, look at, let's begin reading in verse number 11. Verse 11 says, and I, the I there is John the Beloved. He's the one that was leaning on Jesus' breast during the, the Last Supper uh, uh, when he talked about uh, someone betraying him, John the Beloved. Uh, was right there. John the Beloved was a good friend. John the Beloved was at the cross when, when Jesus, hanging on the cross, looked at him and his mother Mary and said, uh, uh, Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. And uh, John the Beloved was a, a, a close friend of Jesus Christ. John the Beloved had, had uh, been persecuted and, and put on the Isle of Patmos to die. And while he was there, he was given a vision. The book of Revelation was the vision that John the Beloved saw him. And in verse number 11, it says, And I, this is after John the Beloved has been called up into the third heaven and, and been given visions of future things. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. We could read in the previous part of this chapter, uh, I started there because there's a lot we could read it just for sake of time, but we could read about how that Jesus was the only one worthy to take the, the role and to be able to be in this position. He sat upon this horse, uh, he, as he sat upon this horse, his name was Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. I think about John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same in the beginning was with God. In verse number 14 of that passage, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This name, this, this, uh, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. By the way, the armies which were in heaven were part of that. I mean, so we're all of it, but we're part of it which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. There is the coming conqueror. And he shall rule with them, uh, uh, and he shall rule them as a, uh, uh, with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God, and he, uh, and he hath on his vesture and on the thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, the coming king. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That is the prophecy that is being fulfilled 
that Balaam spoke of in Numbers 24. Now, let me tell you about the kingdom. Verse 1, and I saw an angel come down from heaven. Verse 1 of chapter 20. Having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones... And they that sat upon them in judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God in which, uh, in which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in the, their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, this is the coming kingdom. Now, I'm not saying this is the final kingdom. Because... After this thousand years, there will be a season that Satan is loosed. And then after that, we read in the book of Revelation, that Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, The great white throne takes place. And all those that are unsaved are going to be cast, death, hell, Satan, all those will be cast into the lake of fire. This world will be destroyed The the Jerusalem from which he'll be reigning from here, that will be destroyed. The heavens that we know will be destroyed. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. That will be the final kingdom. But in the meantime, the next kingdom that we're looking for is this very kingdom. This millennial reign. Now, Next Sunday night, I've been working on a message uh, for the graduation talking about finished. And I I'll, I'll, don't want to preach that message ahead of time, but Jesus worked six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Now, I, I, let me be careful here. I, I, I'm not, I, I'm no prophet, okay? Sometimes you look at numbers, and I want to be careful. I'm not predicting a day, a year, an hour. A, it, you understand I'm not predicting the coming of Jesus Christ. Too many people have failed doing that. Plus, it's not uh, uh, advantageous for us. But it's interesting. Jesus worked day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and then rested the seventh day. We read in the Bible that one day to the Lord is as what? A thousand years. Six days and then rested on his seventh day. That's interesting to me because if we go back through genealogies from creation to Abraham is about 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus is about 2,000 years. That's 4,000 years. Jesus died, was buried, rose again, ascended to heaven about 2,000 years ago. We're about 6,000 years. Interesting, six days. He rested on the seventh day. One day is 1,000 years. Now listen, I'm not predicting a year. <laughs> don't, don't, don't start getting worried. I mean, I'm not saying that Jesus is coming on. I don't know. I'm just saying that it's very possible that, that, that he views it that way, that six days and then this seventh day is a day of rest, a millennial thousand-year reign. I'm not, look, I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying that's interesting to me. What I'm saying is I believe that the, the coming of the Lord is imminent. It's at least seven years away. You say, what are you talking about? Because the next thing on the calendar is the church being caught up. You and I, those that are saved, there'll be a a collection of believers, the Old Testament and New Testament believers that that believed in the blood of Jesus Christ, that, that, that accepted Christ as their Savior, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then we'll be there for seven years while there will be a tribulation going on. And at the end of that seven years 
is what we just read about, the Lord coming back with his armies behind him. I'm here to tell you, the king is coming. There's a conqueror rising, and there will be a kingdom that is forever. This thousand, I don't, I don't, I've talked to my dad about this one, one time, and, and, and I, I want to be careful because I don't know. You, I'm always be careful with, I'm always careful with, with revelation because, uh, look, people who are very sincere and believed God's word missed Jesus Christ because they focus on the wrong part of it. Am I above that? Absolutely not. Are you above that? There's some that preach revelation that they say this is, uh, uh, in our Bible class in, in school, we used a curriculum and they said this is what this, uh, the, the kids that are in the class, they'll know that I was often r- using the curriculum and saying, well, okay, they say this, but unless it's in the Bible that this is true, we don't know that this is the case, that this, uh, uh, this sealed uh, uh, judgment means exactly this, and this is going to be a nuclear fallout, and da, 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 okay, maybe, but nobody knows that for sure, the Bible doesn't say that. So I want to be very careful that, I, that I'm not predicting a date or I don't know what happens. But I was talking to my dad one time and I said, you ever thought about the millennial reign? Have you thought about that? That we're going to reign and judge with him? We read about that in the book of I mean, the word of God is, is brimming, is teeming, is full of prophecy and talking about the coming kingdom. And that you're going to reign and rule with him. That's an amazing idea. I asked my dad, I said, you ever wondered where you're going to rule? Or what area you're going to reign in? And maybe that won't have any, I don't know. But I'm telling you, there's a kingdom coming. It's been prophesied from way back in the beginning of Genesis. We're not talking about something that, that is, is, is fictitious, that, that will not happen. This is coming. Let me give you three thoughts and I'll be done. Number one. Believe in the conqueror. Believe in him. 1 Timothy 1, 16 through 17 says this, Howbeit for this cause, the apostle Paul is telling Timothy, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Then he said this, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The apostle Paul is saying, now listen, the king is coming and I'm going to believe in him and I want to show a pattern for everyone coming behind me that I'm believing in him, that you can believe in him as well. I don't know if there's any in this morning that are lost, that don't know Christ as their savior, but can I tell you, if you do not believe in the conqueror, you will be conquered. There's only two sides in this battle. There's only two sides in this war. The conqueror is coming and you must believe in the conqueror. Buy into it. Believe him. Number two, let me say this. Bow to the king. Uh, The bulletin article is on Philippians chapter 2 and we sang the song uh, uh, about that. I, I, I think about... Uh, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will bow to him. Why don't we just start now? Romans 14 verse 8 says, For whether we live, or we, uh, uh, whether we, live we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to him. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the, and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll all stand before him one day. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We'll all stand before him. He's a king, and I've mentioned this before, that I think we're, we're, we're uh, at a uh, disservice or a disadvantage have not being under a kingdom. I'm thankful for the, the freedom that we have, but do you understand that you and I are servants to a king? He's our king, and he, he's coming. There's a king, a conqueror coming. There's a king rising. He's coming. Why don't you just submit to him now? 
We focus on this world so much. I saw a testimony of a young lady, a video testimony of a young lady who grew up Catholic and as she became of age to make decisions on her own, she went out and decided to go against her Catholic upbringing and attend Protestant, is what she said, Protestant churches. And she said that she began to attend them and she said that, uh, uh, that they were always trying to, to uh, do what is best for you, and it's all about you, and, and, and you'd think that that would be pleasing. It, they were, she basically, she called them rock concerts, these Protestant churches. We'd go to, and all the music was to draw me in, and uh, the message was about me, and she said, but I fa- found, I'm not saying she's right, but it's interesting, she said it, I found that empty, and I wanted to find I wanted to go back to my roots to find a religion that was about God. Wow. She would rather embrace false doctrine than no doctrine, which is what has happened in many churches, Christian, quote unquote, churches. It's about us. It's about me. Listen, the kingdom is not about you. The kingdom is about God. He's conquering. He's the king. He's the Lord. You're going to be serving him then. Why don't you just get a head start and serve him now? We'll stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. If you're saved, you'll stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't allow your religion, your actions, your activities to be about you. I was thinking the other day, I drove, I was driving uh, to church and I was pulling out of my neighborhood and a, a, um, a Missouri State Patrolman pickup truck pulling a boat went in front of my neighborhood right before I pulled out. And I started to think about that, like, a, a State Patrolman with a boat, what would a State Patrolman be doing with a boat? I started to think, well, maybe there's like a search and rescue. That's, I don't know if there was in the area. I don't know. I have no idea what, where he was going. But I got to thinking about a search and rescue. Imagine, if you will, there's someone who's missing. A mother has called 911 and, and a, um, a, a daughter, a, a son, a child is missing. And, and there's water nearby. And, and they begin to put up posters. and They begin to notify uh, uh, all the neighbors and everyone around and uh, they're trying to tell people hey uh, so and so this this child is missing and so the state police come and they bring a boat and they go into the waterways and and they're searching and and there's several boats out in the water and and one officer uh, pulls up to another officer who's in a boat and he's just going to check in and see how he's doing but in his boat he finds him with a fishing pole fishing Now listen, what are you doing? Well, I thought while I'm searching, I might as well have a good time. I might as well enjoy myself. Listen, we are in the service of the king and there are people that are dying. Why is our focus on our pleasure, our enjoyment? Imagine if that had hit hit the news. Imagine if they, uh, you can see the headline. State patrolman fired because he's fishing during a search. But fishing on a Saturday instead of visitation, I understand there's times of rest and vacation, but skipping a time to witness and throw out the lifeline rather than throw out the fishing line. Are we in the service of the king or not? Will we bow to this king now or will we just wait until the day when he really reigns? And then let me say this, thirdly, in regard to the kingdom, let's buy into its existence. This is not, sometimes when people, when you say the kingdom of God and a millennial reign, it's almost like you see that that castle and that little thing that goes over, you know, the Disney, you've all seen it so you know exactly what I'm talking about. The castle that goes up and the little thing, oh, it's some kind of fictitious 
futuristic thing that's not going to, something that's not really real. This kingdom is real. Why do you, I mean, <laughs> almost every book of the Bible talks about this kingdom. This king that's coming. A real man, Balaam, told a real king named Balak, he said, now, before I go, let me tell you what's going to happen in the future. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. Let me tell you what Jesus said about this kingdom. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth the field. He finds a, a, a treasure, and he realizes the value of this treasure, and he finds, he sells everything he has, and he buys the field because the gain is so much better than what he sold, what he lost. You say, Pastor, do you understand what I'm giving up in this world? Do you understand what you're gaining in the kingdom of God? Buy into the kingdom of God. Buy into it. Believe it. He's coming. We don't talk about it near as, I, I don't know, we, I don't speak of it near as much as we need to. The king is coming. A conqueror is rising. A kingdom will remain. Do we believe it? Do we live like we believe it? Are we trying to save those and tell them that are lost and tell them about this coming kingdom? Or are we satisfied that their carcasses get eaten by the birds? Can I tell you? I don't know. I mentioned, I'm not pulling out a spiritual calculator and saying one year is a thousand days and we're at year six. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I do believe this. I do believe that call on home, the trumpet, is imminent. Which that means that you and I may not see death at all. And if that's the case, there are people that you may look into the eyeballs of that seven years from now could be in this army. There, are, there may be people that are around us today that may be a part of this army that the birds eat their carcasses. If the Lord comes back now, it's seven years from now is when this, this battle happens. Are we willing to allow them to be a part of that without telling? Without uh, uh, proving to them that our lives are based, are, are we bought into completely this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God? Or would we rather be fishing during a search? Listen, I, I'm not everything I need to be, but I'm telling you, I endeavor to buy into this kingdom with everything that I have. To bring my wife along and teach my children that everything, everything is about this kingdom. This kingdom that Balaam prophesied of. It's all about this kingdom. It's not about this life. It's not about this, this man. It's not about this church or this... It's about that kingdom. Now, I'm willing. I'm not, I'm not everything I need to be. I know that. Will you join me in following the king? Looking for the king who's coming. Father in heaven, I pray. Lord, you are so great. You are so, you are so high. I have... I don't even have any business preaching a message on you, how wicked and filthy I am and low I am. Lord, you're so great. I pray you'd help me do justice to your truth. Help us, Lord, I pray, to believe in you, to bow to you, and to buy into this kingdom's existence. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't get distracted with the things of this life, but that we would buy into this, this kingdom and serve you and love you, Lord, I pray. Help us, Lord, I pray, to win people to your sake, to your side, and tell people how important this kingdom is. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. With heads bowed.